Thank you for joining us for the worship services here at the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. We hope that these services will benefit to you and will allow you the opportunity to worship God. We realize that many of you are at home due to the coronavirus and perhaps have need of these services, as well as we know there are those who are choosing to stay at home and out of the public due to uh, uh, unrelated health issues that may complicate and have a desire to stay at home and worship from there. We encourage you to use this and hope that this is beneficial to you and your need and your desire to worship God. We also realize that here at our congregation, we are unable to meet at this time, and we're going to continue to postpone services for a few more weeks until such time we've had opportunity to better evaluate the current conditions and make sure that we have a safe environment for those of our congregation and those who choose to visit with us to have a safe environment in which to do so. So all of you at home and watching our program today, we know that all of us are very tired of the pandemic. We wish that this could be over and that we could go back to normal. And so I want to encourage all of us to pray, to pray earnestly to God for relief during this pandemic, to pray for those scientists and those doctors who are searching for a vaccination, that God will bless them with the knowledge that they need to achieve that. I want you to pray for those who uh, who have uh, with our caregivers and for our doctors who are working with those who are sick and, and have the coronavirus and pray for them that they will have those things those tools those medications and again from God those blessings that they'll have that knowledge and that care to care for those individuals so at this time as we begin our worship service I want to encourage all of you to get your Bibles if you're partaking of the Lord's Supper make sure that you have those things readily available and I want us to get our minds ready to devote ourselves to a worship service holy in God's sight. Jesus Christ, our Savior, and your Son, who came to this earth, 
and lived amongst among us to show that we can be Christians in this world today and that also sacrificed his life and shed his blood so that we have that way of, we have that opportunity, we have a home in heaven if we only obey your will. Be with those that's lost loved ones. We know there's many that's uh, without their loved one and we hope that you can comfort them, help them in their time of need. And be with those that teach the word, Lord. We want to make sure that the word is spread throughout the world, not only here locally, but throughout all the land that your word can be spread so that more souls can be saved uh, to have in heaven. Please be with us to this day. We're thankful that we're able to worship on this first day of the week. And we know as us as Christians, that means a whole lot knowing that we have a savior that cares for us. Please forgive us of our sins. Help us to do those things that others can see around us that you are, that we are Christians. And in Jesus name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which to us by faith represents the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may we remember his love, his sacrifice for us as he hung on that cross and suffered and died. We pray, Father, we'll take it in a manner pleasing to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us for our services here online at the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. It is my honor and privilege to stand here before you and present a lesson to you. This morning, my lesson is entitled, A Fire in My Bones. And I want to look at four things that I feel are needed in the Lord's church today. And if you were to go out amongst our brotherhood and you were to ask 12 different people, what's one thing that you think is needed in the church today, I guarantee that you would get 12 different answers. So I want to share with you four things that I feel are needed or necessary in the church today amongst the individual Christian and amongst the body of believers as a whole. So first one, passion. Passion is something that is needed in the church. And you can look at passion in several different ways, but to start off with, I want to share a scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Jeremiah had a passion for presenting the message of God to the people. It was, it was burning up, it was in his bones, it was shut up in his bones, and he could not hold it back. He had to let it out. That's the kind of passion that Jeremiah had for the Word of God. Well, what is passion? Just some definitions or explanation of passion. Allowing one to dream things unimaginable. Someone has a passion. They have this desire. They have this drive. There's something inside them that's just pushing them forward to accomplish something or to go after something. And passion for us and passion for others will be allowing people to dream those things. To dream big things. You know, whenever kids first start off in school, my daughter, when she was in uh, pre-K in Illinois, Char Charlotte, they asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up. And I, I had no idea. She, for the longest time, said, told everybody she wanted to be a pop star. She wanted to sing and dance. Well, you know what, sweetheart? Go for it. If that's what you want to do, go for it. If that's the drive you have, go for it. Allowing people to dream things unimaginable. Only a few and far between people become famous and allow people to dream that. Not only allowing them to dream it, but allowing them to accomplish great things. Passion is allowing people or people accomplishing great things. They've got this passion, they've got this drive, and they accomplish this greatness. But not only allowing these things to happen, but being an encourager of those who are, have this passion and this drive to accomplish these things. Encouraging them to do that. Some examples of people who had a passion and a drive and what it led to. First of all, Martin Luther King Jr. had a passion that could not be suppressed. And we see the results of his passion today. We know that he fought for civil rights for the longest time. We know that he fought for the, you know, getting rid of the racism and all the segregation. And now today, in our society today, we can see the results of that. We can see the results of the passion and drive that he had. Sure, there's still some out there. There's always going to be people out in this world who are going to be prejudiced for one reason or another. But the world for most part is a better place because of the passion and drive he had and what he did in order to change this world. There's many inventors in this world that had a passion, that had a drive, that they saw something that was unattainable and they attained, obtained it. Willis Carrier is the inventor 
of the cooling system, the air conditioning cooling system. And I did a little research and found out he got his engineering degree in 1901 and started working on this in the early 1900s. And how many of us have benefited from the passion and drive that he had? He saw something that was unattainable, wasn't a reality in the world, and he went for it. Everyone, I'm sure everyone this morning, I won't say everyone, I'll say most people this morning are probably watching this lesson in the comfort of their home with air conditioning on. It's hot outside. It's August in Tennessee and it is hot. And you're in the comfort of your home watching this lesson, listening to these words because of Willis Carrier and the passion and drive that he had in order to accomplish what he did. And you know, passion is one of the greatest tools that will cause an individual to go beyond the norm to accomplish greatness. Most people go through this life and they go down the same simple, easy little path. But there's a few who stray off of that path because of a passion and a drive that they have to accomplish greatness in this life. And you can look at actors, you can look at inventors, you can look at um, athletes, astronauts, people who have left the Earth's atmosphere and gone into outer space. They had a drive and they accomplished something that seemed unattainable. This is what passion is. It causes people to reach after things that other people think are impossible to reach. Well, what about a passion for the Lord? What about a passion for God? Jeremiah had a passion and he could not shut that passion up. He talked about it being like a fire in his bones and it was shut up and he was weird from holding it back. What about myself? Let's do some self-reflection here. What about myself? Do I have a passion for God like I should have? Do I have this drive and desire? Are there things that most people think are not obtainable that I have a drive and a passion to go after? Do I have the passion that it takes to accomplish those things, to achieve those things? Do I dream big for God? I want to talk with this one for a moment. Do I dream big for God? And a lot of times when people think dream big for God, they think, well, we're going to go to this foreign country and we're going to you know, build these orphanages. We're going to convert the masses. We're going to bring all these people to Christ. Well, in my mind, dreaming big for God is being successful with one soul. With one soul. If you can convert one person to Christ, you've accomplished a great thing. Someone did a mathematical equation one time on converting people to Christ, and I really like the way it's laid out. It says if every person, you start off with one person, and that person became a child of God, and they determine that year, every year, they're going to convert one person to Christ. So they convert one person to Christ, and then... The person that converted has the same passion and drive. I'm going to convert one person to Christ. So these two people every year are going to convert somebody to Christ. So now you have four converted to Christ. Now these four people decide, I'm going to convert somebody to Christ. One person a year. And after one year, you've got eight people converted to Christ. And you do that every year. And in 20 years, you will have converted six million people to Christ just by going after one. That's dreaming big for God. And the question is, can I accomplish these great things? Can I accomplish these great things? Of course we can. Can I accomplish more than I thought was imaginable? There's things out there that we might think are not within our grasp when it comes to our spiritual walk with God, but they are there. We can reach those. We can attain those goals. We, tr we truly can. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. You think about Paul, and you think about the things that happened to him, and you look at the bad things that happened to him. And here he says, The things that happened to me, they turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. He took a bad situation and turned it good. I enjoyed, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to Brother Blackwell in, the, in our gospel meeting we had back in April. And when he made mention of what happened when he had those contractors come in his house to convert his bathroom to a handicapped bathroom, 
and how he shared the gospel with those four men, and those four men were converted to Christ. He took a bad situation, being handicapped now and in a wheelchair, and he used it for the furtherance of the gospel, just like Paul did. Just like Paul did. He goes on to say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20. That, that's a Devo song that we sing, a song we sing at camp. It's no longer my life that I'm living, but I'm living my life for God. Some people think that's not obtainable, but it is. We can live our life for God just like Paul did if we have that, if we have that attitude. Paul had a passion for God. His life was to live for God. To live his life was to live it for God. Every day that he woke up, he lived his life for God. But then he said to die was to go and be with God. Imagine having that kind of attitude, that kind of passion, that kind of drive in life. Whether I'm alive or I'm dead, it's all about God. Do we have that kind of drive? Do we have that kind of passion? Okay, now that we've looked at what passion is and what that drive is and what some things are, what are some things that can destroy that passion? Well, attitude. Someone has an attitude that says, I want to guarantee that it's going to work. I want to guarantee that living this Christian life is going to be a great life, is going to be an easy life. I can't guarantee that. God can't guarantee that. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what Paul told Timothy. We are going to have troubles. We're going to have problems. But we're going to get through it because God's on our side. So this will destroy passion. You say, I want to guarantee it's going to work. Or say, I want a no-risk free trial before I fully invest. I want to try it out first before I fully invest into this Christian walk. It doesn't work that way. You've got to jump in head first sometimes. And then show me how it works, then I'll believe you. Yes, we do have to show people. We have to be the shining light to people in the world around us so they can see Christ living in us. But when it comes to following God, when it comes to having this passion and, and living our life for God, it can't be, well, you show me first and then I'll follow in your shadow. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes we just have to jump in. We have to jump in. Jeremiah, Noah, Moses, Joseph, all these men had a passion about serving God and they were not stopped because they weren't sure if it, wouldn't, if it wasn't going to work. Think about Noah for a moment. God told Noah to build this ark. Told him to build this ark, and we're going to put all these animals on it. I'm going to flood the earth. I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm sorry that I made mankind. We're going to start all over. And I'm going to save you and your household and these animals that are going on this ark. No one, as far as I know in history, had ever built a vessel of that size up to that point in history. A flood had never occurred on the earth up to that point in history, from my understanding. But yet, he had a passion, he had a drive in order to serve God, to do what God said. He just did it. He just did it. He didn't let anything stop him. Their passion was driven into success. The second thing that I feel we need in the Lord's church is vision. Vision is something that's needed in the church. Question, where do we want to go? What kind of vision do we have? We know where we're at right now. But where do we want to be in the future? I heard a joke, and I thought it was pretty funny. I said, I guarantee nobody in 2015 knew the correct answer to, where do you think you're going to be in five years? Because we see what the world looks like today. But the question remains, where do we want to go? Do we want to stay where we're at, or do we want to be greater than we have already accomplished? Do we want to stay where we're at, or do we want to improve? Do we have a vision of where we want to be as a child of God? When you think about it, the illustration here, businesses that are successful are that way because they had a vision of what they wanted to become. Not what they currently are, but what they want to become. Any business that's been successful is successful because they never accepted being stagnant. They never accepted the status quo. They always moved forward. Always press forward for greater and better things. That's why they became the success that they were. What about us? Where are we at spiritually? As an individual Christian and as a collective body of believers, 
Where are we at spiritually? Ask yourself that question. Are we small? Are we big? Are we impacting the community with Christ? Or are we complacent within the walls of the church building? Where are we at right now? And then with that, where do we want to be? Do we want to be large, spiritually speaking, influencing everybody we come in contact with with the gospel of Christ merely by my nonverbal example, how I'm living my life? Where are we at? Where do we want to be? Where do we want to be? And honestly, those two statements are not an unreasonable vision. Where am I at? Examining myself right now. Where am I at spiritually? Am I happy with where I'm at? If I'm not, do something about it. And where do I want to be? Where do I want to be in the future, spiritually speaking? Because we don't know how much of a future that we have. Day, Lord, will come like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen. You think about people who want to change themselves physically. Someone decides, you know what, I put on a little bit of weight. I've not been doing a whole lot, so I've got kind of lethargic. My muscles have got kind of flabby. I I need to make some changes. I need to start eating right, eating healthier. I need to start exercising and doing things in order to strengthen up the muscles in my body. And you make a plan and you move forward. Do we do that with our spiritual walk? You know what? Spiritually speaking, I'm not where I need to be. My my knowledge of the Scriptures is not where it should be. My mind being set on spiritual things is not where it needs to be. i got some things in my life I need to get rid of. Do we do that? Do we do that? So what's our next step in vision? Make the vision a reality. If I want to move forward, if I want to be closer to God... Make it a reality. Don't do anything to suppress that. If there are things in our life that we need to get rid of because it's holding us back, get rid of it. If there's things that are, in our, that are not in our life that need to be there, bring them into our life so we can get closer to God. Whatever it may be, it's different for each person. Don't do anything to hinder the vision. Don't allow things, distractions to come in your life. And then you've got people around you who, who have a vision and want to move forward. Then you've got others who don't have a vision. They're happy with being complacent. If you're happy with being complacent, don't become a blinder to the visionaries. Don't stop other people. Don't put up blinders to people so they can't see where they need to be going spiritually. Don't give them tunnel vision. Let them get out there and get closer to God like they want to. If you're wanting to be complacent, then make it happen. All right, the next thing that we need in the Lord's church is preparation. Master your skills. Preparation. The idea of preparing ourselves. You know, in the Bible we read, and we're going to get to it here in a minute, but in Romans chapter 12, if you want to go ahead and turn there, there's a list of skills, there's a list of talents, there's a list of abilities that God has given each individual person and talents that we have. You may be in the Lord's church and feel like, you know, I don't have a talent. I don't have a skill. I can't preach. I can't teach. I'm not a good leader. Well, you know what? There's more than that. There's more than that. Master the skill that you have as a child of God. You know, several years ago, I was working with a congregation, and it was a small congregation, about 30 members. And we wanted to find out, you know, we was in one of our Bible classes, and we wanted to find out, the teacher wanted to find out, where did our talent lie? So we took this particular test, and you answered questions, certain answered questions, and depending on how your questions were answered would determine what kind of skill you have as a child of God. And there was one on there, there was one skill, one talent on there that I don't think a lot of people realize is needed in the Lord's church. It's known as being a prayer warrior. There are people in the church, that's their talent, that's their gift, that's their skill. They have the ability to pray for other people. How many times, be honest with yourself, how many times have somebody said something, they've got something going awry in their life, they've got something happening that's negative, and they say, please pray for me, and we say, I will pray for you. Or I say, we'll do, we'll pray for you. You're in our prayers, you're in our thoughts. And we never pray for them. But you know what? There are some people in the Lord's church who when they say they're going to pray for you, they do it because they are a prayer warrior. So master your skills. Follow the guidelines given by God. 
Follow, it's real simple. It's in this book right here. Just open this book and follow the guidelines given by God and then put it to practice. Practice, practice, practice. You have to practice. Now Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 through 6, we read, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Here's a list of some of the gifts that are mentioned in this text. It's verse 1 through, through 21. Teaching. The gift and talent of teaching both verbal and non-verbally, being able to teach somebody Christ through our life. Exor exhorting or exhortation, someone who's an encourager. That's a gift, that's a talent, to encourage other people, to help them move on with that, you know, push forward with that passion. Someone who's a giver of their time, of money, but most importantly, of themselves. Another talent or gift is someone who's a leader. Not everybody has the ability to be a leader, but those who do need to step up. They need to step up. And then the last thing that I feel that we need in the church is a combination of both courage and perseverance. Courage and perseverance. Never, never, never give up. Never, never, never quit. To have perseverance. To push through. To never give up. To never quit. Now the word courage doesn't mean you go headlong into something without fear. Courage simply means doing the right thing at the right time, but not necessarily without being afraid. But you do the right thing at the right time. Thomas Edison never quit, but he did fail. Same with Abraham Lincoln. He never quit, but he did fail at times. The Wright brothers never quit, but they failed at times. But the thing we need to remember about them is that they never gave up. They never gave up. They kept on trying. And again, with the courage and perseverance, never, never, never give up. Never, never quit. And you know what? There's some people in the Bible we can look at as examples of those who have courage and perseverance. Moses never quit, but he did fail at times. Noah never quit, but he did fail. Peter, we could talk about Peter all morning long, but all the times he put his foot in his mouth and he failed, but he never quit. He never quit. Now I want to read to you some excerpts from a book called The Hanoi Commitment. It's by Captain James A. Mulligan from the United States Air Force. And this is about a man about courage and perseverance. On October 6, on October, sorry, he left on a mission in October 1966 to drop a 500-pound bomb on a bridge in North Vietnam, of course, during the Vietnam War. He had a safe zone that as soon as he dropped the bomb, if he got there, all would be okay and he would be in the hands of his comrades. 90 seconds. A lot can happen, 90, happen in 90 seconds. And after he dropped the bomb, he had 90-second flight to get to his safe zone. On his way to the safe zone, he saw the shrapnel in the window of his plane. He was hit and going down. He ejected and landed safely in a rice paddy. But he was captured by the enemy. And for the next seven years, he was a prisoner of the Vietnamese. Three and a half of those seven years, he spent in isolation. Once released from prison, and after those gruesome seven years, ironically, he was on the first plane out of Vietnam, and he was the first passenger off the plane to touch American soil. When he received, went home, he spent the next ten years at home, never leaving. And while he was there, he wrote the book entitled, The Hanoi Commitment. The entire book is about his years as a Vietnam prisoner. In his book, he states this, As I was tortured and beaten by my captors, and then either put back into my cell or solitary confinement, I would find myself saying, I will see my family again, and that's what helped me persevere. I will see my family again, and I will 
That's what helped me persevere. He had something to look forward to. He had a vision. He had something that he was striving to get back to. And that's what helped him persevere. Courage and perseverance is needed in the Lord's church. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and how to, ab- how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and, be, and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Another thing that's needed in the church is courage and perseverance. You know, this Captain Mulligan went through a lot during the seven years as a Vietnamese prisoner of war. And he persevered. You think about this Christian walk. We're on this earth and we're living this life for God. But you know what? Satan's out there. He's trying to torture us. He's trying to capture us. He's setting up traps and snares all over the place. And he's trying to make us leave God. I in my life have known good men and women who were in the Lord's church, who were strong at one time, who because of of undergoing the wiles of the devil, undergoing temptation, undergoing negative things happening in their life, they've left God. God's never left them. They left God. They did not persevere. They did not look to Him for strength. And we need to look to Him for strength. Because in this Christian walk, we're going to have a lot of problems. We're going to have a lot of troubles because Satan's trying to knock us down. We need to have courage doing the right thing at the right time so that we can persevere with God. So four things needed in the church. Passion, vision, preparation, courage, and perseverance. This walk with God, I'm not going to lie to you, it's not easy. It's a lot of fun at times. There's a lot of good, happy times. It's a good balance of good, fun, happy times, great things going on in my life. And and then on the other end of the spectrum, I've got a lot of things coming at me that are negative because Satan is trying to knock me down and get me to quit. But you know what? As long as I keep my eye on the prize, and that prize being heaven in the end, I will come through this successful. So I want you to think about this lesson this morning. Think about your own walk with God. Are you where you want to be spiritually with God? If you are not a child of God, if you've not put on Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism, I can tell you right now, you are not where you need to be. You are in a lost condition in God's eyes. And you need to be in a saved condition in order to have heaven one day. If we can assist you, if you want to become a child of God, we want to help you with that. Or if you are a child of God and you say... Where am I right now in my spiritual walk with God? Am I where I want to be? If you are not, do something about it. Make a change. And if you need us to help you make that change, we'll be more than glad to assist you. So if you've heard this lesson this morning and you need, it, and you need to make a change, if you're ready to put on Christ in baptism, if you have more questions that you need to ask, contact us and we will more than gladly sit down with you and say the Word of God with you. If you need the prayers of the church, we will pray with you. Just call us. We'll pray with you over the phone if you want us to. Whatever you need might be, please make sure you contact us, and we will be there for whatever it may be.
Let's pray. Our God, Father in heaven, great is your name and holy is your word. We thank you, dear Lord, for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. Too, too many to name. Dear Lord, we want to remember that we have a lot of sick and shut in in this congregation. May you be with them. And if it be thy will, dear Lord, make them whole again. We especially pray for the ones in this congregation that have contracted the virus. May we, may you be with them, keep them strong physically and mentally, and please help them to recover quickly. Dear Lord, we want to be with the uh, Kesey family. Watch over them as they go through this time of grief over a loss of a loved one. Watch over them. And dear Lord, forgive us of our sins. And until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen.